paper. So all I'd like to do today is go over what the Northwest Climate Hub is. We're just now getting, getting it started. Uh, my co-directors are with NRCS and ARS, Mike Strobel and Stuart Hardegree, respectively, for the hub. I'll explain a little bit about what the hubs are. Um, um, this is a little bit small for you to read, but basically if you can see that map, there's seven different regions there. Some of them have sub-regions or sub-hubs. These seven climate hub hubs were set up by Secretary Vilsack just a little over a year ago, a year ago February, um, with the idea that um, there was a population out there that was being underserved with climate change information, that we weren't getting the information that we have necessarily, we being uh, federal researchers, getting that information out in a useful and usable way to farmers, ranchers, and private forest owners. We needed to do that. We need to at least share what we know, and, and certainly there are a lot of uncertainties in all that, as Laura, Laura explained uh, in the talk this morning. But it, in any case, um, there's an obligation to get that information out there in useful and usable forms. So the hubs have respectively spent a lot of time this first year trying to understand what's out there in terms of challenges and what would be most useful to do. Their responsibility is to provide um, technical and program support, assessments and forecasts, outreach and education, but um, taking some time at the beginning here to understand what is needed. So let me explain that a little bit more. There's a um, there are a number of agencies out there that are handling climate change information. In fact, if you talk to most producers, they'll say there's a deluge of climate change information out there. What do I do with it? Oh, I just sort of ignore it and go on and respond to what's happening and try to be proactive and, as Justin explained, try to be ready to deal with the variability that, that's out there. And that certainly is a strategy. But we do have some assurance about what's going to happen uh, with some of the envir key environmental variables over a longer time period. Maybe not next year, but over a longer time period, particularly those who are making longer term investments in livestock or in fruit trees and so forth, we do have some pretty good assurance and we need to share what information we have. So what, how, what does that information look like? What kind of tool would be most useful could be rapidly used and could be used with confidence by producers out there? So uh, we're working obviously with a lot of other partners out there, but just really trying to make sure that we have the key information packaged in a way that's simple, robust, strong, and usable. So we're seeing that packaging of information as being a weak link. Want to get it out there. Want to have apps on your um, <clears throat> iPads that, as producers that, that, that are usable and useful in making decisions. Okay, so we're looking at the different um, products in the Northwest that are out there, just sort of doing an, an assessment of those. And how do we look at them? Well, we take it all the way from the climate risk that's out there that's predicted to affect that commodity. And in this case, we're looking at milk production. Um, so you have increased heat stress that can affect uh, for your cows their fertility. Um, there's a decline in fertility, an increase in the rate of infections, decrease in growth, decrease in milk production. Those are the kinds of things that are expected. How can, indi how can uh, individual dairy farmers respond to that in terms of adaptation? Well, they could um, select for different kinds of genetic breeds. They could um, provide some heat abatement strategies, shade or cooling of some kind. Um, change the timing of their livestock rotations or conduct um, selective breeding of plants uh, to make better forage available. The question for us as the hubs is what kinds of tools do they need in order to move in that direction? They need information about the breeds that are out there, cost benefit information given what we have for climate projections, not just for the nation or even for the region, but for the place where that particular farmer is working, and um, what's the availability of different types of seed. So that's just an example of taking that climate risk all the way down to a tool that's useful and usable. Obviously we can't build all these tools, there are a lot of tools kind of out there in different forms. How do we organize that in a way that's useful and usable? 
that's what we're really trying to move toward. Okay, and I'm not going to walk you through all these um, different uh, things. I will mention the decreased summer snowpack that Laura talked about so much um, leads to changes in water, water availability and, and so forth. So anyway, um, that's sort of we, what we see for milk, cattle and calf. Maybe our figure is a little more um, less detailed right now but decreased summer rainfall and increased temperatures will affect the nutritional value of forage, increase the amount of invasive weeds out there and the coverage of woody conifers. What can we do about that? Changes in timing and distribution of the spatial distribution of grazing, which Justin talked about a lot, and um, changes in livestock breeds, changes in grazing areas, what tools are needed, seasonal rainfall projections and information about breeds. So a lot of what Justin went over. So this is the kind of process that we, we go through. We do it for all the major cropping systems. So we can get into to annual crops and look at what kinds of information would be most useful, what tools would m be most of useful. And here we're looking at, okay, so cost benefit. Justin showed some nice dollars and cents stuff. We want to take that climate information down to projecting cost be benefit for individual farmers and ranchers. That's what we'd like to be able to do. Now, understand that there's a lot of variability out there and we can't specifically say for this place next year or next season, this is what's gonna happen. But over the longer term, we can say well, there's increased probability of something or other happening and there are these different genetic stocks out there that you could select from if you're growing wine grapes and maybe you ought to think about, given these projections, use, moving over to this variety. And this is what the dollars and cents look like for you. Okay, so similar things for fruit trees, nuts, and berries. There you've got a, um, an importance of the chilling, availability of chilling. So w when we're doing climate change projections, those need to be translated down into things like chilling hours or degree days. So when we do degree days, what we find is, um, say for the year 2040, that we reach a critical number of growing degree days that now occurs in August that tells fruit tree people, hey, you know, we've had this many growing degree days, it's time to spray, it's time to harvest, it's time to X, Y, and Z. That is moved forward by a month. So that now, what used to be August 15th in growing degree days, now is July 15th. We don't know that's gonna happen exactly 40 years from now, but on average, that's what's gonna happen. Not 40 years, 35. <laughs> um, but on average, we can say that is, in fact, what's gonna happen according to the most conservative climate models um, that are out there. So. Looking at that, I mean, people who are making longer term investments in fruit trees and livestock need to have that information, at least insofar as we have it. So that's the rationale for what we're trying to do out there. I'm going to skip through that. I'm going to mention Ag Biz Logic, which is more in Susan Capalbo's court right now. She's working on that, but she's not going to be talking about it, as I understand, later today. Um, she's talking about policy. but. Pardon? We'll talk a little, bit about this. a little bit about this. So the point of it is <laughs> it's, it's like a, a turbo tax for, for um, climate change. Climate change is one part of it. So it's just, it's just um, using the farmer, individual farmer's information coming right off the tax forms, saying, you know, I'm investing in this, I'm investing in these crops, this is, these are the projections, and, and saying, hey, you know, if you, if you change your cropping system, to a different type of maybe moving from a wheat to a legume or doing a cover crop. This is what the um, the um, what it looks like for you when you're considering these types of options. So, for instance, going to Wenatchee, look, talking to the orchardists, if you invest in shade cloth, given the projections, here's how it plays out. Here's how long it takes you to recoup that investment in shade cloth. So it's getting it down to that to that really um, very specific level, given our current climate projections. That's what we're trying to do out there. Okay, um, 
So we need better forecasting of seasonal climate information, better forecasting of local conditions, and better alert systems. We know that. And we're certainly, so that gets back to the scientists who are collecting the information. We want better, and we don't have better yet. But we're, I know SIG and everybody else is sort of doing their best out there. We, ha in fact, have a lot of folks in the Northwest that are uh, working on collecting the data and trying to get some tools together. Some of them particular to certain places like Klamath Basin, some uh, Willamette uh, Water, um, you know, lots of, of different um, efforts out there. How can we as the Northwest Climate Hub pull together the information that's going to be relevant to individuals? Well, what we go, when we go out, one of the things we hear from people on working landscapes, from the producers, is, hey, you know, don't just hand us a tool done. We want to go back and talk to the scientists and say, hey, can, can we have a hand in designing this tool? Um, this is what we need. And so we're trying to, we're, we're actually getting those people who work in extension, work directly with producers, together with researchers, and going back to, to NIFA, the funding agency, um, saying, hey, we need to fund not just the research, not just the extension, but the two together and put together some tools that are really going to be useful for people. So that's where we're going on that. And we've had some meetings on that. So this is, we're almost done here. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're actually doing now. Just sort of launching off the launch pad here. Um, we are convening research and extension, getting those, those types of folks together. Um, we're assessing what tools are out there uh, and what toolkits are out there, and we're putting together a national level toolkit for producers, um, partnering with the other hubs. Um, we're supporting the expansion of historical and forecasted climate change information that is downscale, that is local, that is something that producers can use and that is translated into variables that really mean something to them. Um, we're funding the development, helping to fund the development of AgBiz logic in terms of incorporating climate change. Um, right now, we're also working on developing a project, working with a climate science center in the Northwest um, and some other um, cooperatives, the Great Basin Landscape um, Conservation Cooperative um, and others. Basically, what we're doing with this project is we're looking at the problem that occurs in many ranches in the West, ranches in the West and that is the incised stream problem. If you get increased drying and increased flooding, that's going to exacerbate that incised stream problem. The incised stream problem is, is something that you see on a lot of these sort of arid lands where you have sort of a flat area and then it's just been cut away. And a lot of times they'll bra blame that on overgrazing. Well, maybe partly overgrazing in the past, but maybe also something to do with removal of beavers and beaver dams. You may have heard some buzz about that. And there may be ways to slow that water down in a stepwise fashion and increase the productivity around that incised stream. And so we're working on developing a tool that will help ranchers analyze the uh, benefits and costs of doing some of that incised stream management out there. So that's just an example of the, of the kind of tool that we're, that we're trying to develop. And so we're, we're um, looking for, we're still in the looking for advice phase. We're applying for funds. We're getting these research and extension folks together. And we're looking for any opportunities we can find to have workshops. And we've recently, just this past week, heard that we've got some funding to do some mitigation workshops with um, landowners. We're um, looking for any opportunities we can find to get feedback. So if any of you all have feedback or advice or things that might be particularly useful with regard to livestock that we could develop, package, make more usable and useful, simpler to use, so forth. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. Um, thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're seeing a lot of movement in the private sector, and a lot of these is, is with um, corporation-funded agricultural advisors, um, and they're handling a lot of the information, but um, any private entity, um, not so much true of the NGOs, but certainly anything that's strictly private is going to have biased, um, they're going to be bi biased in their information that they provide. We know that. And sometimes it's still good information. And sometimes, sometimes they have more financial capability to say, um, say if, you, if you're looking at high-tech agriculture, which is one means of adapting to climate change, is really being careful about how you use water and fertilizer and so forth. And so um, if you have a, something, uh, I don't know, I hope I'm addressing your question, but if, if um, you're getting advice from the company that's providing you the high-tech agriculture, some of that can be good advice, and sometimes they can collect information from you that can help them build their data banks, and that can be a good two-way thing too. But I think you need also um, an un unbiased broker in that mix um, to be able to um, understand what information is useful and usable and what information may be a little bit biased. Does that, does that address your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks again, Dean. Yeah, thank you.